This video is the ultimate guide to astrophotography filters. We're going to cover everything from what filters to use, depending on if you're shooting mono, if you're shooting color, depending on what target you're shooting and where you're shooting from, the amount of light pollution. All of that are things that I'm going to be covering in this video. Almost all filters in astrophotography is designed for either monochrome or for color cameras. With a bit of caveat, but we're going to come back to that. But they are two separate filters and while of course they will be physically fitting each other, they might not actually function very well if you put them on the wrong type of camera. So let's start with the monochrome as that is the most simple to understand, I think. When it comes to monochrome cameras, we have two types of filters. We either have the broadband or the narrow band. The broadband is your standard LRGB filters. L for luminance and RGB for red, green and blue. As the monochrome only shoots black and white images, if we want to produce colors, we need to shoot one color channel at the time. However, it's not so simple because not all LRGB filters are created equal. Take a look at the spectrum here. This is the spectrum from a LRGB filter set from Chroma. And what we can see here is we of course can see the red, the green and the blue areas that they cover with the wavelength in between. A good pair of filters should have relatively vertical lines, so you won't, you don't want to see like a, a slope going up to the top. They should be pretty much zero and then have a hard edge going up. So they've done a pretty good job here. We can also see a faint blue line here on top. That is the luminance channel that's covered the same area. But have you noticed something strange? Look between the red and the green. You can see there's a gap, whereas between the green and the blue, there's an overlap. Why is that? Is that poor manufacturing? No, it's not. This is actually an indication that this is a very, very well thought out pair of filters. What Cromer has done here is they have said, okay, we, we have basically created this gap just below 600 nanometers. Why have they done that? Well, if we take a look, this is the spectrum from another filter we're going to talk about later. It's called the, um, the L Extreme. But what's important here is to look at the green spikes here. Those are light pollution spikes. This is where we come and see um, lights from street light. We have sodium that comes from these sodium vapor light bulbs that are being used in street lights. What Cromer has done here with this spectrum is they have carefully created a valley between the red and the green just there below the 600 nanometers right where you have that sodium line. We have, we have two sodium lines right there meaning that they just created a gap right where we have a lot of light pollution between the two filters. And in a similar fashion, if we go over and look at the overlap between um, uh, the green and the blue, they sit right on 500 nanometers. Why does it do that? Well, if you pull up the, the, the chart again from the L extreme, we can see that right there we have the oxygen two line, which is probably the second brightest line that you would see from a lot of emission nebulas. So here we say, oh, but right in between these two filters, we actually have a line that's very bright and we really want to capture that line. So we're actually going to let both filters capture that line and get data on that line to maximize the amount of output we get out of the oxygen, um, the oxygen line. So as you can see here, it's, it's important that you look for these kind of things, look for that valley in between there, look for the overlap. And this is also why you can't just mix and match filters from different brands you should always try to get filters from the same brand and deal from the same set um, if you're going to shoot LRGB. So get them all together in a bundle. Don't just go and get from different brands because they might have made that cut in different locations and then you might your colors might be a little bit off if you do so. LRGB filters are often used for these wider band targets. So that would be galaxies, it would be reflection nebulae, and sometimes also dark nebulas, um, depending on what nebula is behind it. Um, but but in some situations you would use it for dark nebulas, but at least if you're shooting galaxies and if you're shooting reflection nebulas, then you're going to be using your LRGB. The other type of filters that we see for monochrome cameras is what's called narrow band filters. Narrow band filters are exactly the opposite where we with the uh, broadband try to capture as much light as possible. With the narrow band, we shoot extremely thin lines and you can actually see an example of the spectrum of one here. So we can see you would often have a hydrogen, a sulfur and an oxygen filter. So they would just have very narrow peaks just around those bright lines. So this means now we are able to capture those bright lines and filter everything out. 
uh, else out. All the other data just goes away. The benefit of using this is that you can shoot under very, very heavy light pollution. I've successfully shot pictures like the ones shown on screen here. And this was shot in, I think, bottle seven or bottle eight. I wasn't actually sure. With like on a parking lot full of street lamps, there was so much light pollution in that area. But because I was using these extremely thin narrow band filters, I was able to just shoot through that light pollution and get some decent images out of it anyway. And just as with the luminance filters, not all narrowband filters are created equal. They can have different, the peaks can have different widths. I think you can get seven, five and three nanometers. So that's basically just how wide or the full width half max, I think, is that peak. So basically how wide is the peak? Seven is going to be wider than the five, five is going to be wider than the three. I usually shoot with three. Those are also the most expensive filters, but the narrower the peak, the more that a, a, a light around it is going to be filtered away. If you're shooting with narrowband filters, we are going to be shooting targets like emission nebulas or supernova remnants is where these filters excel. Because these targets emit a lot of light in these three bands, then we can, um, can easily use these filters without losing out on too much data as the majority of the data is emitted in those three bands. So those type of targets, you wouldn't usually shoot galaxies. Again, with a caveat, because I'm going to come back to the hydrogen alpha filter later because bit of a caveat with that, but gotta come back to that. Usually you would not shoot stuff like reflection nebulas and galaxies with a, a set of narrow bands that would be using the broadbands. Now we're gonna be beginning to talk about a lot of like three letter abbreviations. And if you're not familiar with them and if you can count a lot of trouble with like understanding what people are talking about when they have used all these abbreviations, Cosmic Field Guide at the back, there's a glossary where you can look up. So if you're sitting and you're reading, you don't understand like what are people talking about? What does all these things mean? Then it's listed in the back of the book. So you can just look it up. And um, so if you're starting out with a hobby, that's a nice little addition there. You can get that at deepspacebooks.com. Now let's talk color cameras. First, you need to understand what is the main difference between a mono and a color? Well, the color shoots color, the mono shoots black and white. Yes, that's true, but how? You see, on a monochrome camera, you just have an array of pixels and each pixel on a monochrome just collects light regardless of its color and just makes that into a black and white image. Done. Whereas on a color camera, each pixel is divided into four sub pixels where one will have a filter, essentially just a, a RGB filter on top, one for red, one for blue and two for green. This is called a Bayer pattern and this just basically filters out the light for the different part of the sub pixels and then it can just basically have monochrome sensors underneath or pixels underneath that then collect this light and then turn it into um, and turn it into a color image like that. So now that you understand that, we can also now understand why you wouldn't use a LRGB filter on a color camera. Because if you put a red filter in front of a one-shot color camera and you're only using a quarter of the size to actually collect light. So therefore you wouldn't use LRGB filters on that. So what filters do we use for color cameras? Well, we can divide the filters into two main categories. You can divide them into what's called a band pass and a band block or band stop or band reject. Um, they have many names, but it's basically some filters that only allow certain wavelengths through or that only blocks certain wavelengths. And then there's kind of a, a transition area between the two, as you will see in a bit. You will often see manufacturers use a lot of different abbreviations for these filters. Sometimes they use um, LPR for light pollution reduction. Sometimes they use CLS for city light suppression. And sometimes they'll use UHC for ultra high contrast. Most These are mostly just marketing terms they use for the filters. There's no like fixed definition for what is one and what is the other. And um, so some can fall into multiple categories and you might see something that would from one manufacturer be categorized as an ultra high contrast filter and others would call it a SID light suppression filter. So just don't be confused about those names. It's, it's mostly just marketing. An example of a band stop filter could be the Optolong L Quad enhanced filter. You can see the spectrogram for it right here. And as you can see, what they've done here is they just created valleys around those common areas where we see a lot of light pollution. So they've gone for an approach here where they shoot, we want to capture as much light as possible, and but just have valleys so we just try to block the, the worst wavelengths where we see the most light pollution. This is going to give you a relatively true to life color if you put that on. And again, we are really 
going very broad. We're collecting a lot of light with this. And this means just as with the LRGB. This is essentially like the LRGB filter for one shot color cameras. Because again, we're shooting broad. We're really getting in a lot of light. So again, we are good for galaxies. We're good for reflection nebulas, sometimes dark nebulas, depending on the background, all that stuff are things that um, that this type of filter would be really, really good for. Now, on the other side, we also have those band pass filters where only certain wavelengths are run through. Here we see the Optolong Pro uh, UHC, so this is ultra high contrast. Ultra high contrast will often be relatively narrow banded, so they will, will block a lot of light to try and get so much contrast in the picture as possible. And we can see what, uh, what Optolong has done here is that they have basically just created two blocks where light is around is allowed through one around the um, the oxygen line and then another block out around the hydrogen alpha and the sulfur line uh, at out the, in the red area so so here we we have relatively narrow relatively narrow um, areas of light we allow through and we block a lot more than we saw with the filter before However, in this category of ultra high contrast, we also see filters like the Optolong L Extreme, which is a very popular filter. If we look at the spectrum here, you can see here now we have very narrow peaks around the oxygen and the, um, and the hydrogen alpha line. So this is then just a hydrogen alpha and an oxygen filter in one that lets through both of these types of lights at once. So this again for the color camera is closer to like the narrow band, the, eight, um, the SHO filters that we talked about for the monochrome. And again, these would be, be, this would be beneficial in the same type of situation when we're looking at emission nebulas, when we are looking at supernova remnants and those kinds of things. This is where this type of filter is good. And again, you get the same benefits as you do with the, um, uh, with the narrow band filters for the monochrome. Using this, you can shoot under relatively high light pollution Whereas when you shoot with these broader filters, you can't shoot under um, as, um, uh, as much light pollution as you otherwise would. So basically, the, the, the narrower your peaks are around those narrow, uh, those wavelengths for the hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur, the more light pollution you can handle. The wider it is, well, the more light you gather, but also the more light pollution you're going to pick in. But of course, there also exist filters anywhere in between. So some will block only very narrow around the um, the light pollution lines. Some will go wider, some will go like a happy medium in between. When it comes to the color filters, there's a wide variety of filters from different manufacturers that where the peaks have different um, have different width. So here you just have to go and, and, and figure out what it is that you want. My recommendation would probably be to get one that's relatively wide, that just suppresses a few lines um, around the light pollution and use that for your galaxies, use that for your reflection nebulas, and then get something in the ultra high contrast area where they are really narrow, really like narrows in how much light it is, and then use that for your reflection and, oh, sorry, not reflection, um, use that for your emission and supernova uh, remnants uh, to, 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 to go and, and work in that area. And if you are shooting in the city, you don't want to move out and you can also use that to shoot through a lot of that light pollution. Now, I promised I would come back to the hydrogen alpha filter because I have actually seen people use this with success on color cameras. But why would you use that narrow band hydrogen alpha filter on a color camera um, when you um, when, when you're essentially only using a quarter of your sensor, right? Because you're blocking all the light, you only have the hydrogen alpha line that hits the red subpixel. The three others are not getting any data, so you're only getting that, um, um, that hydrogen alpha data in. Now, because what people do is they might shoot either unfiltered or with a very broad filter. And if they're shooting on the light pollution, they'll try to capture as much like color information as they can by, by shooting with these wider filters or maybe unfiltered. And then after that, they might take some pictures with a hydrogen alpha filter in because that hydrogen alpha line is so strong and so powerful that you can, by isolating it, you can shoot through a lot of that light pollution. And then you just take that hydrogen alpha data and you multiply it on top of your color data afterwards to try and basically tell the image where there is stuff and where there is no stuff. And, and then you can just reduce the amount of light pollution you see in your color images, even though you've been shooting a relatively broad. So that's why we sometimes see, and I have seen people use this. I haven't tried this technique myself because I mostly shoot mono, but I have seen people use this on color cameras with relative success. 
I really hope you learned something. And if you did, I hope I've earned your subscription to this channel. And if you have further questions, there's a comment section below. And if you want to go a little bit more in depth, there's a Discord server as well, where there's loads of people actually ask the guys over there to help me structure this video because this is a complicated topic. So if you want to get started with astrophotography or if you are a, a veteran astro nerd, then there is always room for more people over there. We need both new, uh, new people and experience that can help new guys get started with their hobby. So check it out. There's a link in the description. You can scan the QR code here on screen. Thanks a lot for watching. This Phil Flapner does not need 55mm. This is one of those cases where you need to go and look it up. If we look up the uh, little spec in this formula, capital N is the f-stop of your lens or telescope. P is your what's called 